thank you very much. I'm grateful to Anton Zorich for this invitation. Actually, originally, uh, we discussed with Anton if it is possible that I will explain something about Hurwitz numbers, KP hierarchy, and it was <clears throat> assumed to be some kind of private session, but then this resulted in such a representative conference or workshop, so I'm very surprised. However, um, if you don't mind, I will, I will try to feel myself uh, at home, and uh, I will allow to myself some experiments. Uh, this is for the first time that I will try to present the, the talk using Mathematica program. It's not, it's not really a presentation, but rather some, uh, some experiments, computational experiments with Mathematica, with some comments, and also I will supply with some extended comments. So, um, according to Arnold, mathematic, mathematics is a, an experimental science, and the only difference with physics is that the experiments here are much cheaper. So, I will show you how it works. So, I will speak on Hurwitz numbers and all related things. And um, I will try, in my presentation, I will try to avoid uh, consideration of um, geometry of um, configuration objects. So, the Riemann surfaces, the modular spaces, and, and so on. Instead, I will concentrate on the uh, uh, corresponding numbers, on the genetic functions, on manipulations with functions like topological recursion, KP hierarchy, and so on. And I will show what is the ge geometry behind this. So, I will look at the, uh, the story from this point of view. Okay, so um, of course a lot of things will be will repeat. I will be I will not be able to avoid some repetition appearing with Dima's talk, and uh, I apologize for that. But probably I will try to give some alternative definitions, and you would not sometimes recognize it. The object that I'm considering are the same. And especially this will concern with topological recursion. <clears throat> uh, I will speak on topological recursion on, on two other talks, but today I will speak on another subject, on KP hierarchy. It happened that the theory of KP hierarchy and uh, the theory of topological recursion have some very striking similarity, and I will show you how it works. <coughs> but today I will concentrate on the KP hierarchy. So I start with the Hurwitz numbers. Uh, Dima already explained the definition, the geometry of these Hurwitz numbers, but I will look at them from the computational point of view. So I'm, I will, I'm trying to do computer experiments. And the simplest case, the simplest way to compute Hurwitz numbers is to use so-called cut and join equation. It is a kind of inductive procedure. So I recall you that we have, a, uh, we have uh, some ramification at infinity or complicated permutation, and we, and we try to represent it as a product of simple M simple transpositions. And the cut and join recursion, cut and join equation says what happens if we increase the number of possible tra transpositions just by one. Uh, so the just we should analyze what happens with transposition if we multiply it, uh, with permutation if we multiply it by transposition. And uh, a simple geometric consideration shows that if the transposed elements belong to one cycle, cycle, then this cycle splits into two smaller cycles. If the transposition connects two points from different cycles, that the product will, in the product, will a great cycle 
consisting of elements of these two smaller cycles. So either two cycles join together or one cycle split into smaller ones. Maxim, I think you should maybe start from fresh because there are much more people than the morning came to the Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, so this is uh, the some combinatorics or geometry behind. But as I said, that I do not want to, to look into the details of these combinatorics. But just the result of this procedure is some, some collection of combinatorial data. And uh, these con combinatorial data are packed into a certain generating series. And this is called the Hurwitz uh, function. So the full Hurwitz function is some generating series which, <coughs> uh, whose Taylor coefficients have some special meaning. So I have an infinite number of variables, p1, p2, and so on, which corresponds, which will uh, indicate the, uh, which are responsible for the order of ramification at infinity, and one extra variable beta, which corresponds to the number of, of um, transpositions. And, uh, uh, and I, I constitute the corresponding power series. So <coughs> the way I pack the numbers is slightly different from, from the way uh, Dima did. So in the language of previous talk, this is the series uh, we sum up these Hurwitz numbers with usual coefficients. And uh, Dima fixed, in Dima, Dima stock, he fixed, fixed the, the number n of primages at infinity and uh, uh, used n independent variables, x1, xn. Uh, I use a slightly different agreement. I attach one variable pi to each index of length i and use write in, in something like this. So, and sum up over all possible g, n, and depending on the agreement probably I should put that, that's all. Ah. Well, this is either I sum up over all unordered collections, then I sum divide by n factorial, or I use just uh, partitions, then I divide by by the automorphism of this partition. Is this the same? B, B to the power. Hmm? If B to equal to zero, yeah. P one. That's all. Yeah. P one. Just unique. Uh, yeah. Just unique. Okay. Uh, I yes 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 yes. I do not want to to repeat the definition of Hurwitz numbers because it is not important for me. No, 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 but for people who just yeah. start to hear you, they don't understand anything. What we're talking about some numbers, what's some Okay, okay. So once again, let me stress that um, there is certain. Certain numbers which have some geometric, some some combinatorial or geometric meaning, but for the, for the moment it's not important for me. So by definition, I define not the Hurwitz numbers themselves, but the generating function for them, and by definition. So define G by definition is a function in, in this collection of variables defined by this equation. So the 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 expansion of this function with respect to the parameter beta is governed by this formula. 
the derivative with respect to beta is certain differential operator, which I denote w0, apply, apply to this function g. Sorry, for exponent. So this is a definition. And plus the initial condition, yeah. Plus the initial condition. It's a formal power series, yes, in both p and beta variables. So this is a definition. And uh, after the previous talk or from other sources, you may uh, guess that the coefficients of this function has some special, some special meaning. But for a moment, I, I will not discuss this meaning. So what I'm going to concentrate not on the, the geometry behind the numbers, but in the geometry of, of the space of power series. So what kind of events happens in this world of power series. So this is just one of the possible functions that I will treat in my talk. And this is one of the particular examples, but there will be some others. So this is a, you may treat this as a definition. Yes, yes. So for, for each power of B will be only finitely many monomials, yeah? For each power? If, if you fix this number M, which you didn't explain to uh, uninitiated people, yeah? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, you really should make a right formula yeah. for M, yeah, because yeah. No, it's a... No, no, the, if you will, if you increase G, then they will be, so, so even for a fixed power beta, it will be an infinite homogeneous, it, it, it will, if you fix beta and M, it will be homogeneous when you can increase the genus G. So this is, so this is the definition. I don't see how you get anything, uh, because you see from the formula of W0, when you apply to k1, you only get the first one vanishes. So if you, you and the second one vanishes also. So the exponent, sorry, sorry, exponent of exponent of g. This is the equation. Of exponent of g is equal to is e to the power of p1. It has terms of any degree. So this is the definition. Um, the operator, the so-called cut and turn operator, uh, has the property that it preserves the quasi-homogeneous grading. If you have monomial of degree of the fixed degree, n capital, then the result will be of the same degree. So this differential equation, it's a linear differential equation with constant coefficients, and it splits into a finite, finite dimensional linear equations. So in each subspace of polynomials of fixed degree and p, we have this finite dimensional linear equation. So it's uh, the first, second year students know how to solve this equation. The result is just the exponent. The exponent of uh, this function is uh, computed as exponent of this operator w0 applied to the, to the initial condition. Again, you do not be afraid to take this exponentiation because in the finite domain, if you fix the degree of polynomials, the, the quasi-homogeneous degree in P, it will be a finite dimensional space. You just take the exponent of a matrix. So you have a linear operator act acting in finite dimensional space, and you take its exponent. So how to compute exponent? It's very simple. If you have a matrix, how to compute the exponent for the matrix? You should take the simplest way to, to, to choose a basis, the eigen basis, so that it becomes diagonal. It happens that this oper operator w0 is semi-simple. It has a nice basis, eigenbasis, and nice 
eigenvectors. So eigenbasis is a, these are sure functions. These are the same sure functions that appear in the theory of symmetric functions and uh, in the representation of symmetric group. And uh, these are symmetric functions um, corresponding to, uh, use, if you identify this ring of polynomials in P with the ring of symmetric functions, P are uh, power sums, uh, Newton polynomials. Then, then these are uh, sure functions. So uh, the sure functions are certain collection of polynomials, uh, certain polynomials parameterized by partitions, and the amount of these polynomials is the same as amount of monomials. So actually, the sure functions form a, an additive basis in the space of polynomials in P, and this is somehow an alternative basis with respect to the basis of monomials. Sometimes it's convenient to expand polynomials in the basis of monomials. Sometimes it's, it's more convenient to expand this in the basis of sure functions. So for this particular case, uh, the eigen, eigenvalues of this operator w, w0 are sure functions, and the eigenvalues are, are also known. This m is the same as w. Let me. Ah. OK. So this is the way how do I compute this function in my computer experiments. So the true functions are also implemented here. For a single partition consisting of single parts, these are so-called complete symmetric functions. These are related to the PI variables through uh, this identity. And for multi-part partitions, these are so called, how it's called, Fubini, Trudy. Well, there is a determinant presentation through the partitions. So this is exactly, I put the definition. And this is, what do I get? Oops, sorry. Where is, ah, here. So these are short functions for small number of partitions, for small number of parts. So for instance, there are uh, two-dimensional space of polynomials of degree two, and there, there is a basis consisting of monomials, p1 squared p2, but we can use these two polynomials just in another basis. Symmetric functions, PN, uh, powers, of powers, some powers of independent variables, okay. Newton polynomials, yeah. Okay, just so, uh, so for instance, this coefficient, if I take a, so I use here the coefficient which is uh, obtained from the sure function if we substitute p1 equal to 1 and other to 0. This is related to the dimension of the corresponding uh, reducible representation. And uh, this is just the coefficient of the expansion of this function e to the power of p1 in, in sure basis. So e to the power of p1 is just a, considered just a function as a function. e to the power of p1, and it depends on p1, but we consider this as a function in the whole collection of variables, and we expand it again in the sure basis. The linear combination of sure, sure functions, they, and these are the coefficients of this expansion. So this is how the expression looks like. The, here I did not expand uh, the, the power series in beta, it's, uh, the coefficients are here analytical expression in beta, but you should ex consider these analytic functions in beta as also as a formal power sums. The, the in individual Hurwitz numbers, what uh, we, we are interested in, are the coefficients. Is this small o, is it kind of dummy variable to keep? This is just my own way to keep the Quasi the, the degree, yes. So I computed it 
a homogeneous degree. I computed it up to degree here eight, probably eight. And here are some just initial number of terms, some several terms initial. And here are the voila. This is the, the cut and join equation. So on the first line, I wrote the original cut and join equation. Just I checked that my guess about the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions is of this operator are co correct. So the first line is uh, the cut and join equation for this exponent of, of the Hurwitz function. And the second line, I replaced the exponent of the Hurwitz function by the Hurwitz function itself. This g is the logarithm of this. And the equation after this substitution is modified, modified a little bit in the unique term. So instead of second partial derivative, the nonlinear term appears here, the, which, which is the product of first order partial derivatives. So this is the two alternative ways to represent the uh, cut and join equation. Now the main subject of my talk, the KP hierarchy. And the main statement is that the function that I wrote here and also participated in the Dimas talk is the solution of KP hierarchy. And um, um, uh, I will speak about this KP hierarchy. This is infinite, a particular infinite system of partial differential equations in unknown function. Uh, the bottom indices are partial derivatives. Uh, it's, uh, it has constant coefficients. You see it's nonlinear. There are terms of different terms which makes it nonlinear. And there is huge infinite system of such an equations, of such equations. And there is a, some sophisticated way how to produce these equations. And the, even the way to produce these equations is not so simple. So it looks unbelievable that it is possible to produce at least one solution. However, I claim that the Hurwitz function does satisfy this equation. So the, let me substitute, and you will see how it works. It, so it works. <laughs> and uh, it looks like a miracle. So that, the, that the main goal of my talks today is to explain that this result is somehow obvious. Can I see the equation once again? These are the equations. Yeah, but it's invariable p, huh? so it's a family of solution depending on beta. Yeah, so, so, so for each parameter beta, so one parameter fam family. Beta does not involve into equations. So one, one parameter family of solutions, right? So uh, I will in explain you in a few minutes the theory of KP hierarchy. It's a very nice theory. And there is a special community of integrable system people who work on this. And uh, they, when they speak to, when they communicate to one another, it's usually they pretty well understand each other. But it's almost impossible to enter this domain from outside. It's like a kind of some, mafia or... <laughs> um, uh, Oh, it's called sector, yeah. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to open some secret, which is guarded very carefully by this community. So it's a, I will work like a spy. So I, I will explain what is the hidden behind these equations. And this the, really, the story is very simple. When, whenever I... Uh, talk to these people, and if I explain my point of view, they said, of course, we, this is the way we are thinking about this. But they never manifested this in, in their papers. So <laughs> strangely, what I, uh, 
will be talking is uh, well known by specialists, but it's guarded very carefully from so that the people outside will have some special respect to these people. So this is a situation is approximately like this. Imagine uh, some textbook on algebraic geometry and some chapter devoted, devoted to Grassmannians. And this chapter starts with the lines. Definition, the Grassmannian is a projective variety given by the following equations. And then you have the list of Plücker equations. And then using this definition, they derive all properties like dimension, intersection theory, Schubert partition, and so on. So this is the way how this system, how it, it works here in, in the community of, of <laughs> integrable system. So consider the space of power series and p variables. And this power series contains one nice variety, infinite dimensional variety, which is so important and so crucial that it has no special name. It's, it is something like sacral object that is never mentioned. So uh, this is a space of solutions of KP equations. Actually, we, we speak, uh, let me consider uh, to, told, uh, let me name it tau functions. So the tau function is, uh, is a, an exponent of a solution. Tau function is the exponent of solution. So the, this object, this variety is very nice. It's a homogeneous space. There is a huge symmetry group. It has nice geometric properties. And it's very easy to identify points of this, of this space. And I will show how it works. And of course, like any other algebraic varieties, could be, it could be due by its ideal, by its equation. But this is one of the way to uh, define the equations is just uh, the, plus, the corresponding equations. But uh, this is probably one of the worst way to, to describe this variety. So the, what I claim that the, the original thing is not the space of, not the equations, but the space of solutions. This, that's variety. And there is a many, many different ex explicit and nice and convenient ways to identify points of this. And the, the uh, Equations the same themselves are not so important. So, for instance, when you work with Grassmannians, you know how to treat them, how to take planes, how to move them, how they behave geometrically. And you know that, you remember that they, they are satisfied by certain equations. There are certain Plücker equations. Even most mathematicians are aware of the existence of Plücker equations, but I'm not sure that there are many who will present explicit form of the Plücker equations. But however, you know how to deal with Grassmannian, is even without knowing the Plücker equations. So the, the equations themselves is something secondary. So what's the, the original thing is the space of solutions. And the similarity between, between with Grassmannian is not by chance. Actually, this is the Grassmannian, so-called Sato Grassmannian, and this is the ambient space of the Plücker embedding of, the, of this infinite dimensional Grassmannian. Uh, uh, and uh, the fact that it is infinite dimensional doesn't make a lot of difficulties. Essentially, this is just Plücker embedding of the Grassmannian. So let me explain how identify solutions as the points of the, of the infinite dimensional Grassmannian. The best way to understand this correspondence is through the so-called boson, boson fermion correspondence. The boson fermion correspondence is a very nice 
physical name which has nothing to do with bosons, fermions, and there will be no physics at all. So not, don't be afraid. So I have a space this infinite dimensional vector space, and I have chosen already the coordinates. Uh, there is a basis consisting of sure functions. So I, I treat this as uh, an infinite dimensional vector space with a basis, with a fixed basis labeled by partitions. And there is another basis, another also vector space labeled whose basic vectors are labeled by partitions which provides a just an, another incarnation, another version of the same space. And this coordinate correspondence is just the, the boson-fermion correspondence. So boson-fermion correspondence is just coordinate isomorphism of two vector spaces whose basic vectors are labeled by partitions. So let me explain what is this. It's uh, an infinite dimensional uh, wedge space. So I start, I start with us some uh, supplementary uh, space, the space of, of Laurent series in uh, one variable z. Uh, I will consider this just as an infinite dimensional vector space labeled by integers, whose vector by sec vectors are labeled by integers, integers. So z to the power, so this n could be interpreted just as a super index. It's a um, uh, top index. It's not the exponent of, of z because uh, I will usually not use the multiplication of these elements, so just consider this as an infinite dimensional space whose basic vectors are labeled by integers. And then from this vector space, I will produce such infinite, from the elements of this vector space, I will produce such an infinite which uh, products. So each term in this vector product is a, a monomial on Z or linear combination of monomial, monomials in Z. And uh, I will, uh, so he, this is an example. Uh, this is the product which corresponds to I term Z, Z to the power minus I. And this is what is called the vacuum vector. It, it corresponds to the empty partition. Then any other basic vector is obtained from this one by changing a little bit the exponents of the z variable in infinite number of places. So for instance, if I increase here the exponent by one, let me put zero. This corresponds to this partition, or this. And so you see, so if you change just this exponent, it corresponds to one part partition. Instead, I will increase something here. So it's partition one one, one but uh, the order here is not correct. So I use skew symmetry to organize this exponent in an increasing order. And so all the, the same, I can use, um, I can use uh, linear combinations and I use uh, polylinearity and, and uh, uh, anti-symmetry to expand any, any product of this kind as a basic, as a linear combination of basic vectors. Plus uh, z 
say with coefficient a and minus two plus b. Okay. Okay. So using uh, polylinearity and Q skew symmetry, we expand this and for instance the sign could appear and so on. And now the definition. So we, we take any such an infinite wedge product and by definition, uh, yeah, so, so we have uh, this identification. So here we have this space of infinite wedge product space. And the boson fermion correspondence is just this coordinate isomorphism. And by definition, we say that the power series is in P is a tau function if it corresponds to a decomposable wedge product, to a unique wedge product of some elements. The definition is very simple. So here we have something complicated, but if you look at the fermionic side of the story, uh, tau function is just an infinite wedge product. So for instance, here uh, I expanded this as a unique wedge product. I expanded this, and through the boson fermion correspondence, I just replace any v by the corresponding sure function, and obtain, I will obtain and then they pass to the logarithm. So this is exponent, and this then pass to the logarithm. And if you do everything correctly, this is an example, very simple example of solution of KP hierarchy. So let me check. So I substitute this function to the KP hierarchy, and this is the result. Of course, the computation is not so simple because when you differentiate logarithm, you obtain a rational function. When you differentiate many times, it becomes more and more complicated. So the result is not very hard, uh, nice, and it's not so easy to do this by hand. But however, if you put over common de denominator, you get zero. <laughs> So the, the result is very simple. So this is the definition very, is, is really very simple. So the, the, the tau functions is just the object that correspond to decomposable wedge products on the fermionic side. So if you have such a uh, decomposable wedge product, then the linear span of this VI form um, a subspace of half dimension, which is somehow complementary to the subspace of, of uh, regular functions. So we have the space of Laurent series, and there is a subspace of regular series, and this, the one corresponding to this is somehow complementary. And all such uh, subspaces form the Grassmannian, and actually, we deal with the open cell in this Grassmannian corresponding to those for which the coefficient of the vacuum, vacuum vector is, uh, is uh, non-zero because we would like to take a logarithm and to produce a power series. So this is an open cell on this Grassmannian. Uh, and it's very easy to treat the points of this Grassmannian on the fermionic side, but when you pass to the bosonic side to the space of power series, it becomes something very non-trivial and miraculous. But the Grassmannian itself is a very nice object. Uh, yeah, and of course the, the point of the Grassmannian is the, the, this, this wedge product this is, uh, does not change if you pass to a linear combination of, of few eyes. So up to the scalar, we, we obtain the same the same tau function. So it really depends on the, on the linear span of these phi's on the point of the Grassmannian. 
So let me make one, some conclusions. The first conclusion is that the uh, Grassmannian is a homogeneous space. Any plane could be transformed to any other plane by linear transformation. So it produces a huge group of symmetries on the space of solutions. So having one solution, one can, could apply a linear transformation, and you get another solution. But when you uh, have a, some transformation, and you know how it acts on the fermionic side, how it acts on uh, infinite wedge product, uh, it's very easy to follow. But if, when you translate this to, to bosonic side, you get something non-trivial. But anyway, you have a huge symmetry group, uh, so GL infinity, and its algebra GL infinity small, uh, which is a group of and correspondingly algebra of symmetries of the KP, KP hierarchy. So let me give you some examples. So uh, I will speak about elements of Lie algebra. It means that if you apply the Lie algebra element to the wedge product, you apply the Leibniz rule. You have many, many summons. You apply it to the first element of the wedge product, to the second, and so on. And let's take this element z to the power m. It acts as a shift. But such a simple operator, it's very easy to compute its action on the fermionic side. On the bosonic side, on the other hand, we have something unexpected. It corresponds to multiplication by a variable if m is positive and the derivative is m if m is negative. Uh, What's peculiar here is that this operator, of course, uh, always compute, uh, commute. Uh, the shifts, two shifts, are all, do always compute. But here we have uh, Heisenberg commutation relations. So they almost compute. They compute up to a scalar. This is because of the infinite dimensional space. If you produce this correspondence between action on, on, on this space and action on, bosonic, on the infinite uh, space of uh, on the corresponding Fox space and the ambient space of this uh, isomorphism. There will be some scalar correction will appear. So actually we have the action of not G infinity, but of, of its one dimensional extension, which usually doesn't play a lot, but you should remember it somehow. Even this correspondence in the first two lines gives uh, a nice corollaries. For instance, it allows one to give a, a more invariant definition of this boson-fermion correspondence. So for instance, let me explain how, using this, you can produce in an invariant way uh, the mapping of this correspondence to the wedge product space. So given a polynomial of p variables, how to know what corresponds to this polynomial on the other side. It's very easy. We can interpret this polynomial as a result of application of this operator to the function 1. So on the right-hand side, we take a vacuum vector, which corresponds to the function 1, and then apply repeatedly to this vacuum vector 
the operators corresponding to these operators. So f of a1, a2, and so on. So we plug to this polynomial the, these uh, operators, and the, we repeat them, apply this uh, repeatedly, and we obtain certain combination of uh, basic fermions, and this is the result how it works. On the other hand, there is a way to go in inverse direction, given an element of the wedge product, how to identify the corresponding polynomial here. One of the ways, of course, is to expand this in the sure basis and to apply this coordinate correspondence, but there is a way to do this in an invariant way. For that, we will use the Taylor formula. So given a function f, how to compute this function using the Taylor expansion formula. We know that every power series is identified by its partial derivatives at the origin using the Taylor formula. What's to do? What we have to do? We take exponent of sum pi d over qi applied to f of q. This is the Taylor formula, right? Every function is a linear combination of mixed partial derivatives at the origin this coefficients monomial in the variables. This is a, the uh, Taylor formula. So now let me, let me interpret this formula in terms of this on the right hand side, how it works. So we given given some vector in the, on the fermionic side, what we have to do, we apply this family of operators, e to the power sum of pi, and partial derivative correspond to a sub minus i divided over i. So this is a when we apply this, we consider p as a formal parameter. And then uh, we should substitute here q equal to 0. What does it mean, this substitution? Is that it means that we just take the free term of, this, of the resulting power series. T taking the free term means that we should take the coefficient of the vacuum vector, so so-called vacuum expectation. So this is the procedure. Given a fermionic element V, we apply this family of operators and take the coefficient of the vacuum vector. This will be result, will be a function in these parameters P, and this is exactly the what we are looking for. This is the way, this formula is usually, this is the formula that you will f probably find in the textbook when you uh, will search for boson fermion correspondence. So just looking at this formula, it's not so easy to recognize that this formula hides just a very simple coordinate isomorphism between these two vector spaces. This is, this is just sophisticated way to represent the coordinate correspondence. Okay, so this is one example of operators. And by the way, what does it mean, the action of this operator? Uh, uh, the first line, the invariance of the Plucker equations of the uh, KP equations with respect to this operator is just the, the fact that in the KP equations, all partial derivatives are of order at least two. 
It means that if you change the linear terms of the function f, this doesn't change the equation. So you can freely change linear terms. The linear change of linear terms does not affect the solutions. So invariance of these equations with respect to adding a linear term is just corresponds to this AM symmetries. Uh, on the other hand, these equations also these equations are also have constant coefficients. So the shift of variables doesn't affect them as well. So the shift of variables corresponds to the partial derivatives. So the symmetry, these two symmetries means that you can change linear terms of the function and also apply arbitrary shift of variables. And the equations are these transformations send solutions to solutions. Then the next, the next operator corresponds to this uh, operator in Z. So you can take any differential operator in Z variable and you can treat it as a global linear transformations of the space of uh, Laurent series in Z. So for instance, if you take the first order operator in Z, you obtain certain operator, uh, which I, I call lambda here. And this is how it looks on the on the uh, bosonic side. So this is either it contains terms which have first order partial derivatives with coefficients depending on the variables, then second order derivatives, and sometimes the just products of two uh, variables. Uh, question. So yeah? what's the computation ratio for the lambda and lambda? Is that to the it's a Verasoro. Verasoro. So on the on the right hand side they compute, but due to this uh, uh, extension, it. The, 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 what is the simple charge equal to one what? Hmm? Simple charge of the Verasoro computer. It's standard one over twelve or one. So, huh? C equals to one case. Yeah. Yeah. So this double dot means the normal ordering. So if you take combination of multiplications uh, by variables and uh, partial derivatives in such a way that all variables are put to the left and partial derivatives to the right. This effect only the case when m equal to 0. And also, there is a similar formula for the operators of order 2. So order two partial differential order two partial differential equation on the fermionic side correspond to this complicated operator in bosonic, which is some combination of partial derivatives and multiplication by variables. And in particular, the cut and joint operator, operator by chance is the one corresponding to m equal to zero. So cut and join operator is one of the examples of this family. So it doesn't matter what is the origin of this operator. So let me just show me. Uh, you, uh, here I just check by applying, oops. Wait a minute. I applied these operators to sure functions uh, on bosonic and fermionic side and to compare. This is my best, my simplest way to guess about these coefficients. So if you, of course you can derive these coefficients from combinatorics of power series, but it's more safe if you just take, have experiments. Okay, so now for instance, now let me give a, uh, give me, let me give uh, the proof that the Hurwitz, Hurwitz function does satisfy the KP equation. Actually, no, there is nothing to prove. 
by definition, the Hurwitz function is, is given here is just composition of two symmetries, <laughs> of two symmetries of KP equations. We start with a function one, which is a trivial tau function corresponding to the uh, vacuum vector. Then apply the exponent of a1. a1 is an infinitesimal uh, symmetry. Its exponent is, is a honest uh, symmetry of the KP equation. It transforms solutions to solutions. And this is another transformation which translates solutions to solutions. So any exponent of infinitesimal transformation is a symmetry of the whole system of KP equations. So the very form implies that it is a solution. It's supposed to be W zero, right? W, yeah. W, yes, yeah. Yeah, W. M, I changed the time to point, I changed the notation. M will be preserved for the... If I don't understand, Maxim, you say <coughs> when you write the first line, you assume it's solution. So you're saying it's a solution because it's a solution. One is solution. Function one is solution. But, but when you say that exponential g uh, or j is exponential b w zero, the first line, yeah. then you assume that it's a solution. Yeah. So what's the statement then? You assume it's a solution, then it's a solution. Oh, no, you say it's a solution of the first PD, evolution PD. No, no, no. The function one, just the function F identically one is a solution. No, but the statement here is that the solution of the first PDE. Of the whole system, why? Well, you define J as solution of this evolution equation here. Yeah, it's then solution. it's solution of KP. Okay. This is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this function has a particular meanings, particular uh, the coefficients of this function has particular meaning for the combinatorics of Hurwitz numbers, but the very fact that it's solution of KP is much more simple. It, it's not it's not something special about Hurwitz numbers. It's a very special, a very general property of 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 KP equations. So you can play here, put some other operators, and to produce a lot of other solutions. Some of them has physical meaning, some of them have combinatorial meaning, but just apply any symmetry, apply any symmetry of KP equations. Right? Now, do you believe that it's really obvious? <laughs> Not sur surprising. So when discussing KP hierarchy and tau functions, I cannot resist to, to discuss one more function, which is called witten kontsevich or uh, potential. So uh, if you put in alphabetic order, you put kontsevich witten but in Russian, spelling Witten stands before Kontsevich. <laughs> it's a, also a partition known as a partition function of two-day gravity, two-dimensional gravity. And again, I will not discuss what the physical background, what's the meaning of all these physical models. Let me just define the function itself. And again, I define it on fermionic side. I just define it through the fermionic presentation as an infinite wedge product. The infinite wedge product phi, phi one, phi one, phi two, phi three, and so on, defined in the following way. So there is certain differential operator, which is called A, the first order differential operator, which acts uh, on functions in Z. And the first equation is the uh, solution of this equation. Up to a certain simple change is, is the same as the area equation. The coefficients it's quite easy to compute, and these are explicit formulas for the coefficients. There is an induction formula for the coefficients. The second function is uh, just we apply a to this phi 1. This, the next function, number 3, is we apply a twice. 
But when we apply A twice, it's the same, it's a multiply by Z minus two. And so on. We can represent this fermion, fermionic vector in two different ways. So the corresponding two presentations are the same up to linear change in the basis. So the, the linear span of these functions are the same. So either we take all different powers of the operator A, and the operator A in each step it decreases the, the leading term, the degree of the leading term by one. Or we just take phi one, phi two, then apply z minus square to the to the phi one, apply z minus two to the to the phi two, and so on. So let me show you uh, how it looks. So I just checked that this function is a solution of the area equation, and here is the corresponding matrix uh, presentation of the corresponding point on the Grassmannian. The rows are the coordinates of the, of the vectors for which we take the wedge product. So the first row corresponds to, to phi 1, the next phi 2, and uh, every second row is obtained from the previous one by a shift by 2 to the left. So we have such a diagonal matrix, and then we take the wedge product, and this is just by the use, let me use it as a definition. So this is a, what we do, obtain the result. So let me list, so this is just definition. Again, my definition is that just the, the way I compute it. I do not discuss for a moment the physical background, but just an explicit formula. First of all, by construction, this is a, a solution to KP equations, right? We defined it through the <laughs> infinite wedge product. Besides, it's a, the corresponding play is invariant with multiplication by z minus 2 or z minus k for integer k, which corresponds to, to the power, uh, to derivative in even variables. So the, the result is a function which does not depend on even variables. So the independence on even variables is equivalent to the invariance of the corresponding subspace by uh, respect to multiplication by z minus 2. So the corresponding system of equations is called the KDV hierarchy. KDV hierarchy is obtained from, from KP hierarchy by uh, an additional requirement that the all partial derivatives with respect to even variables is equal to zero. So the function will be function in odd variables. Uh, on the other hand, it's the uh, this subspace is invariant with respect to operator A, and also with, we can consider uh, uh, increase A to some power or multiply by Z to negative even power. So this produces also some, some relation on the fermionic side on the bosonic side. So this is what corresponds to this operator on bosonic side. And these are so-called Virasoro constraints. So this is partial derivative with respect to variable number 2m plus 3. And this is a linear combination of partial derivatives with linearly depending coefficients and also this is Wolf's second order partial differential equations. And uh, there are certain correction terms, uh, constant correction terms, which, which are due to uh, the central extension, which should be taken into account. So this, uh, just I checked that it does satisfy. And the famous Witten's conjecture 
uh, say that this function has an interpretation in terms of intersection numbers on modular space, and then the, the Taylor coefficients of this function are intersection index indices of psi classes on the modular space of curves. And this, uh, this conjecture was proved by Maxim Kantsevich in a very sophisticated way. So the proof is very nice, but not so simple. So after that, uh, a number of different independent proofs was given. And uh, now I will present a proof which makes this statement always obvious. So it's the same obvious in the sense that if you do understand properly uh, uh, the theory of KP hierarchy, then it really becomes kind of obvious. So uh, anyway, if you wish to <coughs> uh, if you wish to prove this statement, you should know uh, know some in independent way how to compute the corresponding intersection numbers. So you should produce somehow some explicit form how this could be computed, and then to show that the way you compute fits into uh, degenerate series which satisfies the corresponding integra integrable properties. So uh, Maxim Kansevich used some nice uh, uh, polyhedral model for the modular space, which, is, which was the reduced the four uh, computation to complicated, quite complicated, but elementary combinatorics of polyhedra. Um, I will use another approach through the ELSV formula. This has an advantage that it is absolutely algebraic. There is no, uh, it's, it's completely done in the terms of algebraic geometry. Actually, uh, to my understanding, the ELSV formula, this is probably the, the most direct way to relate intersection theory on modular spaces to something which could be computed more explicitly. So at the time when Maxim Kansevich proved this conjecture, the ELSV formula was not known. It appeared a little bit later. So now, using the ELSV formula, we can, we can uh, do this. So, ah, yeah. So here I check the, the, the conjecture. I have some implementation of intersection numbers. So this denotes the generating series which, which uses the honest intersection numbers. And the, on the right-hand side, I took the partition function of, of uh, corresponding to the fermionic presentation. And let me compare. Oh, the result is different. Now, OK. Let me check once again. Oh, it works. <laughs> Actually, I am cheating. Here, I am cheating a little bit because here, when I compute, when I implemented, implemented uh, intersection numbers, of course, I used the, the, the statement of the Witten conjecture, the <laughs> Virasoro constraints. <laughs> so it's mostly to demonstrate. Ah, by the way, uh, here is the, how the uh, KDV hierarchy looks like in, in T variables. It's uh, not, it does not generate the whole system of, uh, of the equations. It's so-called by Hamiltonian form of KDV hierarchy. And it produces only, uh, to, to, to obtain equations of the hierarchy, we should integrate this with respect to T0 many, many times. Then equa equations become more complicated, but here it's in very compact form. 
Now let me pass to the ELSV formula. The ELSV formula is a formula which relates Hurwitz numbers, which, is, which are coefficients of the function that I considered in the first part of my talk, to another objects which are so-called Hodge integrals. Hodge integrals are certain intersection numbers on the modular spaces of curves. Uh, again, I insist that I am not going, I will not consider, <laughs> I will not consider the geometry of the configuration space. So in particular, I will not define in details, I will not repeat the definitions of lambda and psi classes from Dima's talk. So uh, this is in Anyways, this is a certain collection of uh, combinatorial numbers indexed by partitions. So lambda and psi are certain classes on cohomology space, on, on, in cohomology of modular spaces. We produce monomials, take the intersection numbers, and these numbers participate in this generic series. And again, comparing with Dima's talk, I, I pack these numbers in a different way. Again, I use uh, convention when I multiply the, the function uh, corresponding to this partition to the variables labeled by the corresponding index, so not, not the power of the variable. Anyway, we obtain on one hand, some huge collection, some huge amount of data corresponding to intersection numbers on modular spaces. And on the other hand, huge collector, uh, collection of numbers corresponding to the uh, combinatorics of the symmetry group, which are labeled label, uh, Hurwitz function. And the ELSV formula says that there is a way to translate one collection of data to another. There is a way to translate intersection numbers, uh, Hurwitz numbers through intersection numbers, and actually this could be convert, uh, conver uh, inverted. So Dima presented the original form of the LSV formula, and let me just say a reformulation of this on the language of geratic series. So on the left-hand side, we have a generic series. Oh, wait a minute. Let me. I should have it for my experiments. So here are some uh, the, the corresponding functions. So these are terms of homogeneous degree uh, n and corresponding to uh, modular space of curves of genus G. So in the notation of Dima, this is homogeneous polynomial in n independent variables, but uh, I use the same collection of variables, and uh, the, instead of exponent of, of these x variables, I use the index of the t variables. So it's just another way to pack, pack the same functions. And uh, when I use this not agreement, I can put them together to, to to form a unique uh, power series for, responsible for all Hodge integrals. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, Hurwitz numbers. The ELSV formula doesn't, hold, doesn't work for the case of genus 0 and 1 or 2 ramification points at infinity because the corresponding modular space do not exist. So I just subtract them. And the remaining terms corresponding to Hurwitz numbers on in the stable case are related to Hodge integrals. And the result to, of this correspondence is just a substitution of variables. So the Hodge integrals depend on t variables. These depend on p variables. We just make this substitution. And also, 
here the parameter is beta, here the parameter is epsilon, and here I use even third parameter u, which is just the same. All of these parameters are related by certain exponents. So I just put this formula, and in my computer experiment, I just literally put this substitution. This is a substitution of t variables. Uh, this is substitution of epsilon. And this is the, these are explicit formulas for the contributions of the genus 0 and 1 and 2 uh, ramification points. Ah, oh, yeah, it works. So now, how can we prove the Witten conjecture using the LSV? Let me, let me look once again to this relation. On the left-hand side, so uh, if you ignore this, this small uh, modification, the left-hand side is a solution of Kp. We should know, we should, we want to prove the right-hand side also um, a solution of Kp, at least for certain parameter values. So uh, it would be nice if this change of variables would be a symmetry of, uh, of Kp. Then if, we, if this is symmetry, then it translates the solutions to solutions, then we have the Hodge integrals, uh, uh, generic function for Hodge integrals does satisfy Kp hierarchy, and in particular those corresponding to uh, epsilon equal to zero, which corresponds to just uh, Hodge integrals which do not involve lambda classes, which those which correspond to the Witten conjecture. Unfortunately, this linear change of variables <coughs> is not a, uh, is not uh, uh, symmetry of Kp hierarchy. And moreover, this change of variables is not invertible because every for each k we, for each k we have uh, it's, this change is not triangular. For each k we have uh, the whole uh, power series uh, combination of pi with with all coefficients non-zero. So it's not so. Direct, but however, it's somehow simple. So the idea is to, to use some intermediate function, some intermediate change of variables. I would like to use some intermediate variables q and to make some change of variables p goes to q, is replaced by q, uh, such that uh, which is, however, a symmetry. There are certain linear changes which are which really symmetries. And we choose this transformation in such a way that the uh, resulting function is uh, turns into uh, conserved Schwitten potential for the zero parameter value. So it is slight modification, it will be a slight modification of the generating function of Hodge integral. It will be agree with a, with a Hodge function for the original parameter value, but then when the parameter changes, it's, it, bit, it will be slightly different. So uh, in order to apply this, I need to know which kind of, which linear transformations do produce uh, symmetries of Kp hierarchy. To answer this question, so let me formulate once again this question. So which changes of p variables produce symmetries? So to do this, let me look once again to this table, to this correspondence. Oops.
Here, you see this lambda operator acting on bosonic space, which is essentially a linear vector field, linear first order equation. So this is this part is the infinitesimal linear transformation of p variables, right? Linear linear differential operator is a is an infinitesimal linear transformation of the ambient space. Of course, it has some extra terms, which is actually, actually modifies the quadratic part of the function. So we should check independently how it acts on the quadratic terms of the function. But the, the main contribution is produced by, by this linear change of variables. It corresponds to lambda m, and lambda m is the first order differential operator on, on this in z variable. So let me formulate the conclusion. So I consider the linear span of p variables, just the linear span of p variables. Let, and let me identify this linear span of p variables with the polynomials in x variables. So we, x to the power k corresponds to the pk variable. So any linear transformation of this space of polynomials produces a linear transformation of p variables. And uh, uh, let me consider linear transformation of the space of polynomials given by just a substitution. A change of, of x variable produces a linear transformation in the space of polynomials, or more precisely, in the space of power series. And through this coordinate correspondence, this could be interpreted as a linear transformation of p variables. So, and uh, the boson fermionic, boson fermion correspondence says that, that this kind of tra transformations of this kind are always uh, symmetries of KP hierarchy and up to some linear terms, uh, uh, quadratic terms. OK, so let me look once again to this substitution. And I uh, choose q variables, in, q variables in such a way that for k equal to 0, I should get q1. So q1 is equal to t sub 0. i to the power i over i factorial one times pi. So if I use, I have chosen already what should be the q one variable. Well, this forces that my change of coordinates should be of this form. So this is the change of coordinate. Of course, you would, up to if you ignore the dependence on the parameter u, you would recognize the change of coordinates which have been used in the talk of Dima. I even, I even use the same notations for the coordinates x and z. So this is the change of coordinates. The, such a substitution produces an automorphism on the space of power series. And this produces a linear combination, a linear transformation in the space of p variables. So let me, let me show how this works. First of all, so this is the, our change. 
well, it depends on parameter u, and it's not regular at, at u equal to 0. However, it, it is certain infinite invertible uh, series if you allow to put u in the denominator. And this is the inverse series, which also have been appeared in the talk of Dima. <laughs> so if you substitute here instead of z, this complicated series, then you obtain the x variable itself. And uh, Dima explained how to produce, how to prove this identity using Lagrange inversion or using counting trees. But the result is, is, mm, is as this. So now we have uh, to, to consider series uh, corresponding to the t variables, which are given here. And you see what happens, how to pass from this series for a given k to the k which is greater by 1. We see that the Taylor coefficient should be multiplied by i times uh, u squared, i times u squared. This is corresponds to the action of this operator. So the, this series is obtained from the similar series for corresponding to i equal to 0 by repeated, repeated application of this operator. This is a misprint. Field vector field d, it's d over dx? Or? Yeah, d over dx. Are you written d, d over dz? Here. No, 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 above, <laughs> uh, just half a meter above. The field D, capital D. Oh, here DX, yeah. Fortunately, I, I, I'm able. Uh, this line corresponds to the comments. Like. <laughs> and what's nice about this substitution, that this um, vector field has very nice expression in terms of z variable. A simple, a simple computation shows that it becomes, uh, the coefficient in z it becomes poly uh, polynomial in z variable. So here is a check. So this, uh, this operator becomes this in z, in z variable. So if you pass to the z coordinate, you start with this original series, which is just z by definition, and you apply this operator, which is polynomial. And you get a nice conclusion that this uh, series corresponding to the tk variable is polynomial in z. So, so I just nest, the common nest means the application repeatedly uh, one and the same function, so I apply, uh, obtain uh, these polynomials. So, for instance, if you apply them twice, we obtain such a polynomial, which corresponds to this linear change of coordinates. So, if you, what's what's interesting that that the uh, change of coordinates does not extend at u equal to zero. But the t functions do extend. They are, they are polynomial in u. So the, uh, the linear term is, uh, is z times u to even power. And the free term corresponding to u equal to 0 is just uh, z to the word power with a double factorial coefficient. So. This is the intermediate change of coordinates. And uh, for u equal to 0, it corresponds to just, uh, uh, to, to just uh, written concentric fun uh, function. So this is the end of the proof. So once again, we use this intermediate change of coordinates. Uh, this change of coordinates is on 
automorphism of the hierarchy, so, so it also satisfies KP equations. Uh, and uh, if you, the change involves involves negative powers of u, so it's, the change does not extend to u equal to zero, but the resulting function does extend, it's regular at u equal to zero, and for u equal to zero, it is, uh, for u equal to zero, it is a, a witten concierge function up to this rescaling of independent variables. And that's all. Maxim, but uh, uh, you use here the cut and join operator. Yeah. So it's not purely algebra geometric proof. So it uses some combinatorics. You cannot prove that uh, this is a tau function without key. Uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, there is an interpretation of the cut and join equations through algebraic geometry. It is done as follows. Uh, let's uh, consider, instead of Hurwitz numbers, let's consider Hurwitz space. And uh, we, uh, let me mark one of, the, one of the critical points. And let us check what happens when this critical point tends to infinity. This uh, procedure could be described combinatorially, but also it could be described algebraically as, some, as a kind of divisor as a, as a divisor in the Hurwitz space. It has certain components corresponding to this summons in the counter joint equations, and we should analyze the multiplicity of its in, uh, uh, reducible components. This is done in the thesis of uh, Sergei Shadrin. So this cut and joint equation has an algebraic interpretation. And it can be proven. It's, it's, it is done. Yes, yes it, yes, it, it, it has. Proved algebraically in terms of algebraic geometry, right? So it's just count of multiplicities of certain divisor under some degeneration. And by the way, uh, this change of variables correspond to certain transformation on the fermionic side, on the corresponding transformation on z variables. This allows one to, to, to compute what happens with the cut and join equation. So uh, the cut and join equation is also subject to, to change if you apply this change of p variables. It's not so obvious to compute the result, but the, the computation simplifies a lot if you make the computation not on the bosonic, but on the fermionic side. So on the fermionic side, you need to deal with differential operators in just Z line. So it's, uh, there is no infinite sums involved and so on. So the computation is quite elementary. So uh, I do not present here the cut and join equation for the function G could be, uh, could be uh, rewritten in terms of the function g tilde. And then we could put u equal to zero in this equation to specialize to u equal zero. And this will recover the uh, Vera Soro constraint of the Witten concierge potential. So, so this method allows one not only to, to prove that Witten concierge is a tau function, uh, logarithm of a tau from a solution, but also to identify it explicitly. Uh, okay, so uh, this is okay, right? So this is the end of the story about uh, KP hierarchy. So let me conclude, repeat once again the ideological part of the story. It says that there is a nice space of solutions. And there is a nice space of solutions, which is really very nice. There is a 
huge amount of independent ways to, to produce points of this space, to, uh, to find relationships between points of this, to sp of this space, and so on. And the equations themselves do not play essential role in this picture. And moreover, there is a huge symmetry, G infinity, uh, acting on the space of solutions. So for instance, starting from one solution, applying transformation, you may produce many, many others. So tomorrow, I will discuss the uh, geometry of topological recursion in a similar way. And uh, to my understanding, the situation is, looks very similar. It's not uh, seen very well in the formulation of Dima, but uh, however, the picture is as follows. Again, we have some huge space of uh, functions, which are, so the, here solutions parameterize points of the Grassmannian. And uh, in the theory of topological recursion, also we have solutions. And here we have potentials of, uh, which are obtained by different procedures of topological recursion, varying the initial data of the recursion. And I claim that this solution also have, if you just look at the whole, the whole totality of all possible potentials, it's a very nice object. And it has also a lot of symmetries. And it is parameterized by Lagrangian Grassmannian. In particular, again, there is a huge symmetry group acting on this space. And this space, in, in this case, is a simplex group. And this simplex group is acting on this Lagrange Grassmannian through so-called quantization of quadratic Hamiltonians. So this is uh, more or less the same that was discovered or described by Givental. But I will treat it in a more regular way. So again, on one hand, one can apply uh, topological recursion explicitly for a given initial data. On, on the other hand, the same function could be obtained in a different way. You start, you compute just one particular <coughs> potential corresponding to that you know in advance, and then apply a suitable transfer, transformation which translate one Lagrangian plane to another. And this the result will be the same. So the picture looks uh, similar. But actually, the, when you look at the details, the details are quite different. For instance, there is certain integrable system, so-called BKP or CKP hierarchy, which also parameterized by the corresponding uh, Lagrangian or isotropic Grassmannian in the infinite dimensional space. And this is not the same. Strangely, this is not the same. So uh, I will, the details will be uh, tomorrow, but uh, I will not come back to the KP hierarchy. The only thing that uh, I would like to uh, stress that when I will be talking about uh, topological recursion, just have in mind this correspondence. Well, I think that it's better not to start topological recursion right now. I have a, fortunately, I have 
two more talks, so probably I will postpone it for tomorrow. <laughs> so, let me stop here. I don't know. No, it it exist, It does exist for the uh, BKP or CKP, but not in this case. So here the correspondence will be somewhat different. So, <laughs> huh? Can you comment on super KP? I am not aware of this. <laughs> 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 